And welcome back to Berlin. It is my honor to introduce and moderate this final panel of the conference, uh, which is about Bosnia and Herzegovina as a continued transatlantic project. We have spent two days discussing past and present challenges, problems, but also Bosnia's huge potential. And what we want to talk about now is future commitment, future commitment of Washington and the European capitals, including London, to Bosnia specifically, which is often put on a back burner given the focus on many other foreign policy security issues, but also big focus on resolving Kosovo-Serbia dispute. And I will start by introducing Senator Shaheen, who is the only woman on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. She has impressed me with her insightful and well-informed questions on Bosnia and the Western Balkans during many Senate testimonies that she has chaired. And I had an honor to answer some of her questions and I'm pleased to be able to put back some of them to you today. Senator Shaheen knows Bosnia and Balkans very well. She has traveled to the region many times, most recently for the 20th anniversary of Srebrenica genocide. She's also a senior member of the Senate Arms, Armed Services and Foreign Relations Committee and a vice chair of the Europe Subcommittee. She's known for putting, uh, proposing the legislation on a private enterprise investment, a private enterprise bill for the region, but also pressing the State Department to do a comprehensive overview of American funding, which goes into the projects for unemployment of youth in Bosnia. Ambassador Hoitzkin has a very long and impressive biography, but I'm just going to give you several highlights that are particularly important for our Bosnia discussion today. He served as a head of the policy unit of High Representative Javier Solana during the time when Mr. Solana, jointly with the EU Commissioner Patton and former um, NATO Secretary General Lord Robertson and late Lord Patty Ashdown, helped mobilize Europe and America together to create the central government in Bosnia that President Clinton has just referred to in his speech. Afterwards, for 12 years, Ambassador Hoiskin served as foreign policy advisor to Chancellor Angela Merkel. And since July 2017, he is Germany's UN ambassador in New York. And finally, Natalie Tocci, one of the most prominent voices in the EU foreign policy discussions. Natalie is a special advisor to the EU high representative and vice president um, of the commission, Josef Borrell. And during the day, she also has a job as a director of the Istituto Affari Internazionali in Rome and quite a number of other functions as well. So warm welcome to everyone from Berlin and we are very, very glad to greet you from the studio on the last day before the lockdown. Um, just to briefly set the stage and then I will hand over to you, Senator Shaheen. Uh, we have spent these last two days of the conference discussing the problems related to the state capture and lack of functioning rule of law in Bosnia as really two key drivers of instability in Bosnia and the region, um, but also two key drivers of emigration of youth. In last five years, 5% 5 of Bosnian population have left the country. And I think the message that was communicated during these two days from younger generation Bosnian politicians, but perhaps most forcefully today on a panel in which we assembled the representatives of civil society, activists working to unify, to, to desegregate edu educational system, young people working in Banja Luka with Transparency International. The message more forcefully communicated by them was, we do not need things to be done for us. We just need strategic acupunctural interventions and help to actually form a level playing field. Because one of the perhaps 
most b biggest downsides of the Dayton Constitution is that more than in any other federal state, it has created a system so full of blockages that there is no level playing field for those actors who want to enact change. Um, and so this is where we come to the question, can Europe and America with the US elections uh, behind us and with President-elect Biden about to take office in January, can Europe and America reunite around the common goal, pay more attention to Bosnia and act strategically to create this level playing field uh, through small acupunctural interventions? And so, Senator Shaheen, if I may pose the first question to you. Um, Expectations are high with the electoral win of President-elect Biden, who knows the region, knows Bosnia well, very popular. Um, Pro-democracy actors feel very relieved and expect United States to return to promotion of democracy and institution building in the region. I want to ask your honest opinion, how realistic are these expectations of full-blown US return? especially giving, given the large number of other foreign policy priorities. Um, and what do you expect in terms of level of engagement? And accordingly, what do you think division of labor between the US and the EU should be? Well, thanks very much, Maida, for that question and for inviting me to participate on this panel. I appreciate being able to join the other panelists today. And I think um, we will see as the new administration takes over um, where, where their energies go. Um, we know that we have very big challenges at home right now in the United States because of the coronavirus pandemic and the president-elect, to the extent that he's talked about um, his first hundred days in office, he is focused on the pandemic and what we need to do to address that and also the economic fallout from that. But we know that when he was vice president, um, Joe Biden was the highest administration official to visit Bosnia-Herzegovina, and he has a great deal of interest, and he has already said he intends to rejoin the international community and the alliances that the Trump administration has stepped away from. So I think there will be a great deal of interest in um, the Balkans, and in particular, Bosnia-Herzegovina because of President-elect Biden's understanding of foreign policy and the importance of this region to Europe and to the United States. Obviously, instability anywhere in Europe has an impact on the US and we know there are conflicting interests at play in Bosnia, Herzegovina, as well as other parts of the Balkans that we don't want to see create the kind of rifts that the Dayton Accords ended. So I do think we will see a great deal of interest and there's a great deal of interest in Congress um, for Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, we have not been back in this last year. I have not been back because of the pandemic, but I'm looking forward to being able to visit. And you started by talking about young people and the interest um, because of opportunities in leaving the country. You know, my first visit to Bosnia-Herzegovina was in 2010 with former Senator George Voinovich, who was a huge champion of the Balkans. And I can remember one of the meetings that we had that impressed us the most when we were there was a lunch we had with young people, uh, university students, students right out of university. And they talked about their frustration with governance in the country, but also with opportunities for the future and feeling like their future was in leaving the country, even though they didn't wanna do that. I was very disappointed to see in the report that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee had done about the importance of youth in Bosnia-Herzegovina and how our programs can be more helpful, that the same sentiment has been expressed almost 10 years later in terms of how young people are looking at their country. So it's very clear that we have a lot of interest in the country, 
a lot of commitment to continuing to support efforts there to help the country move forward. And that that is gonna be um, an endeavor that we have engaged in jointly with the EU. And I would expect that to be in the future, not just in terms of incentives and um, assistance, but also in terms of some disincentives. Um, the United States has imposed some sanctions on um, Mr. Dodik and those who would seek to tear apart the borders of Bosnia-Herzegovina, um, some of those in the Republic of Srpska. And I would hope that the EU would also look at the kinds of disincentives or sanctions that they could put in place that would help discourage that kind of activity. So I think this um, new administration is gonna have a real commitment that I share, and I know members of Congress on both sides of the aisle share, to doing everything we can to support the country as it moves forward. Thank you very much, Senator Shaheen. And this brings us perfectly to our question for Ambassador Hoiskin. Um, Ambassador Hoiskin, your, I mean, Bosnia, there's so many challenges on so many levels, but focusing on where you sit and what your perspective is, um, every year in the UN Security Council, you get a taste of political obstruction uh, and the challenges to Bosnian sovereignty. Um, as the meeting in November each year takes place to review the progress, the OHR reports, the RS reports, and the future of U4. Now, just yesterday on the anniversary of the Dayton Peace Agreement, um, Russian Foreign Minister Lavrov came to the official visit to Bosnia and met the head of the state, Mr. Milorad Dodik, um, who is member of the presidency, not in the capital, um, but in eastern Sarajevo without a flag, without any insignia of um, the Bosnian state. This is very symbolic. What you witness regularly is a much more aggressive rhetoric and attacks on the institutions at the central level, but also institutions of Europeans and Americans that are still there to kind of act as a stabilizing factor. So may I ask you, and this includes also the Constitutional Court and the three international judges, one of whom is a German judge. So could I just connect to the last statement of Senator Shaheen that we will be looking not just at incentives, but also disincentives, how to really deter these challenges that you witness regularly in the UN Security Council and how, what is Germany willing to do? And will Germany, looking to the new presidency and how to mend relations with, with the US, is it willing to join sanctions um, which the United States uh, has initiated against Milorad Dodik and Nikola Spiric, but also potential new sanctions in future. Thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. First, uh, to, to say how much I appreciate to be on, on this panel, and it's wonderful, if I may say so, to, to be on a panel with uh, Senator Shaheen. Wonderful to see you. Um, you come from one of my favorite states. We went skiing in Bretton Woods last year, and. Uh, Bretton Woods is kind of a symbol of the new uh, Biden administration that comes back to international um, organizations and um, you know, the international um, organizations were founded in Bretton Woods. So it's wonderful to, to um, have you. Um, and um, in general terms, we need to be back um, and be on the same line. Um, let me just start, not maybe on, on Bosnia, but just one remark, it is just for somebody who is a transatlanticist, it was just awful to see during the last month that on the question of Kosovo and Serbia, how to solve the, the outstanding issues that um, the US approach represented by Ambassador Grinnell and the um, European approach um, represented by our special representative Lightcheck were actually contradicting each other. And uh, we need to come back to the, the, the period that we had um, before where Europe and the US are working hand in glove and um, I'm very optimistic that we'll see that. On Bosnia, um, we have indeed um, witnessed uh, over the last um, years, in particular the last month, 
a um, increased um, rhetoric from um, our um, uh, Russian partners. Um, we have seen this just a few weeks ago. I know that um, Valentin Insko is, is um, listening in or, or watching at the OHR. Um, he was put under enormous pressure by, um, by Russia. Russia trying to undermine the OHR, um, Russia trying to undermine all the bonds that keep uh, the country together. And um, of course, they would love to have the OHR go. Um, they hate the fact that, and you alluded to, that we have this um, um, uh, constitutional court, one of the Dayton um, ingredients that are key with where Germany, together with Switzerland and other countries, we have um, provided one of our best uh, uh, judges um, there to help. So as an international community, we have to watch over um, Dayton. We have to see that the links um, of the country remain together. Um, we have to counter what unfortunately we are witnessing is a rewriting of, of history. We had yesterday in the Security Council a meeting with the residual mechanism, you know, the, the um, uh, residual mechanism of the Yugoslav court. And the only, the only interest the Russian ambassador had was um, first the status of Kosovo and then the health of Mr. Mladic. Nothing, nothing about, we just mentioned 25 years of Sarajevo, nothing about the victims, nothing about the, um, um, the, the um, mothers of the 8,000 men and, and boys that have been killed. And on my question, if he would, um, if he would criticize um, Mr. Dodik and um, the Republic Serbska for, um, for actually giving the name of Radovan um, Karacic to a dormitory in Pale, he didn't react. So you have a rewriting of history, you have a new populism there, and um, you, you see that Russia tries everything to um, undo uh, Dayton and um, um, go in the direction of uh, um, independence of Republic Srpska and, and uh, um, um, whatever intention Russia may have there. So we have to counter that. Number one, we have to work together. Um, of course, we, we want the country to um, assume full responsibility for itself. Um, but as long as um, the, the forces are not um, really so that they can they actually work together enough, the different um, the, 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 the two entities, um, we have to keep um, we have to keep the OHR. Um, we have to, to think about using the bond powers. We have to see to it that this country uh, stays together. But at the same time, we must not turn a blind eye on the fact that many members of the political class are rather thinking about their own wealth, their own well-being, their own entity, and not think about the future of their country that can only be in the European Union and the future um, of their um, children. Last point, children, um, youth. Um, this is key. When in my previous um, job, when I was working with the Chancellor, we had and we continue to have the so-called Berlin process. And one of the most important results was the creation of the of RICO, of this office, uh, youth office in the Balkans. We took this from the German French youth office that after the Second World War brought German and French youth together. A, a enormously successful enterprise. And I believe that this is where we have to work on. We have to get the young people together in the Security Council. I quoted the example of um, a, 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 a class or a school where um, the, the different ethnic uh, groups, uh, the children from different ethnic groups just refused to follow um, what was uh, given to them from the authorities that they have to meet in separate classes. We have to overcome this, that the, um, that the uh, Muslims, the Bosniaks meet in the morning in class and the um, Croats in the afternoon. We have to do this. We have to work for the youth. And I think operationally, when we work, we have, of course have to work with the governments, but we have to increase our work with civil society, with the representatives of those who really want um, a, a European future for their country, who want um, the youth to stay in the country, want to fight um, fight corruption, want to fight against the vested interests that are still there. So as an international community, we have to remain there. Um, but um, with regard to conditionality and everything, we have to discuss that. 
I also rely a lot on um, what uh, Miroslav Leitschak, um, who is very experienced, um, and what we hear from uh, Natalie Tocci in a, in a moment, what is said from Brussels, because after all, we need this um, European future and we need to have European then um, um, answers to the to the question. So I, the question on sanctions, I don't uh, react to it directly. I mean, we have uh, something to have Natalie to respond. So thanks for, for including me here today. Ambassador, thank you so much. I just want to quickly say that if uh, you find time, all three of you, please do take uh, you know, half an hour, one hour of your time when you get a chance to watch um, the panel um, at this conference with these young activists who were fighting for precisely this school desegregation and other projects that you have just mentioned. It's called Despite Politics, Citizen Potential in Bosnia. And I was moved to tears to listen to their work achievements and potential. Uh, so please, when you do find a moment, rewatch that panel. Um, since you mentioned the plague of Radovan Karadzic on the student dormitory, you gave me a very good um, um, introduction to or, or an example of how really uh, sometimes minimal but strategic and united work of internationals in Bosnia, Europeans, Americans together, um, often leads, a, a very small pressure can lead to big results. So just last week, um, or this week, they have removed the sign of Radovan Karadzic from the dormitory um, in, in Istočno Sarajevo, and the uh, president of the High Judicial and Prosecutorial Council, who has been entangled in huge corruption scandals, has, been, has resigned from the institution. And this is mostly due to the concerted pressure of the Europeans and Americans, I would say the quint in Bosnia. Now, that brings me to Natalie, who we are looking to for some reassurances that we can get Brussels on the same page. Um, Natalie, EU has an enormous amount of potential power in Bosnia. It's in fact, you know, Brussels institutions set the framework. It's the only long-term framework that really provides for some thinking as to how to improve the functionality of the state and how to move Bosnia forward in its decision-making process, in the reforms, as to, you know, hopefully one day join, join the EU. Um, now, the problem is that many say the EU approach to Bosnia and the Balkan generally tends to gloss over, gloss over the problems um, in order to claim progress for progress sake. Do you think that's a fair criticism and how can it be overcome? How can we get Brussels on the same page as Berlin and Washington and London? Thank you. Well, Maida, I think uh, in many respects, yes, yes, it is a fair criticism. And, and I think, um, I mean, to me, the sort of starting point of, of this reflection is, is really that of understanding the nature of a paradox that we, not as European Union, I would say as Europeans, and I would actually say transatlantically are, are essentially in. I mean, we, we sort of see on the one hand, uh, what I think has emerged very clearly over the course of this conference, uh, i.e. that um, the uh, original Dayton architecture certainly did uh, a lot to uh, secure peace, uh, but the way in which it was constructed and certainly the way in which it was implemented essentially um, made it increasingly obvious, not only the way in which this was actually moving uh, contrary to the establishment of a number of other things, obviously beginning with uh, individual rights, minority rights, uh, but also the problems that you were highlighting of, uh, of state capture and, and functionality. And more broadly, I would say, or rather more specifically, the way in which uh, the implementation of this architecture uh, has essentially been going at, and it has been at loggerheads with the ethos underpinning uh, the European acquis communautaire. Uh, and, it, and it's really sort of as, as basic as, as this, which I think indeed then leads to the situation in which uh, this 
should have been. Uh, I mean, you know, so the emergence of this paradox should have uh, therefore led uh, the European Union to really put a spotlight uh, on, uh, uh, on on this problem. And hence, you, you rightly sort of mentioned the question of, of sequencing. Uh, but as you say, what we have been seeing in practice is that although the sequencing uh, should have, if we think about the way in which the sequencing in general uh, on uh, uh, on the enlargement process has actually been um, sort of, you know, theoretically putting more emphasis uh, on the reform uh, side of the equation, but we have then seen that in practice, uh, it has been moving, in a sense, in uh, in the opposite direction. So, indeed, if we kind of take as far as Bosnia and Herzegovina is, is concerned, uh, the 2019 uh, opinion, uh, it is clear that, indeed, in principle, democracy and functionality and, and, and procedural reforms really should have been uh, front and centre, but in practice, they have been uh, kicked down, down, down the road. And I think in many respects, in sort of trying to work out how is it that not only are we in this paradox, but we have actually been sort of living in this paradox right now for a, for a number of years. I think, unfortunately, we cannot sort of escape the reality that what enables us to sort of, you know, linger in this, uh, in many respects, stalemate, uh, is the fact that uh, the enlargement process has been moving not, you know, sort of much slower than at snail's pace. Uh, and it is because of that slowness that one can essentially uh, remain into, you know, in this sort of gray zone uh, and, uh, and essentially sort of avoid resolving the underpinning paradox uh, that I think bedevils the Western Balkans in general, but I think specifically concerns uh, Bosnia and Herzegovina because of the specific uh, data and pecu uh, peculiarities that, uh, that indeed I think this conference addressed in a very effective way. So I've been sort of scratching my head and trying to sort of understand, you know, what is it that, that can be done about it and who is it that uh, should be moving? Now, I think we cannot escape the fact that in order for there to be any movement at all, uh, it cannot be, I mean, this is not going to come as a manna from, from heaven. I mean, and certainly not as a manna from, from outside, which of course, and I'll come obviously to the outside and what is it that we as Europeans and, uh, and, and transatlantically uh, should be done. But I think we cannot escape the reality that there has to be uh, some movement from the inside. Uh, and I think it is uh, absolutely essential for you to put uh, the spotlight really uh, on the role uh, of youth and the demands coming uh, from youth. Uh, and, and indeed, you know, unless and until that is, is listened to, I mean, until that movement in a sense is, is somehow captured, uh, there can be, you know, sort of uh, all sorts of uh, pirouettes coming from outside and it's certainly not going to do the trick, particularly given that from outside as as Christoph was, was highlighting, it is not just Europeans and Americans, but there are also others, which are obviously moving in a very, very different uh, direction. Now, I think sort of moving on to what our responsibilities as, as Europeans are, uh, I think it is important for us to acknowledge that actually, not only we do not have anything to lose uh, by actually being much firmer on questions of democracy and rights uh, and, and governance and, and judicial reform, etc. Uh, but that actually we have a lot to lose if we don't become more assertive and firmer in this direction, and particularly as far as conditionality is concerned. And although there is always, and this regards not only Bosnia and Herzegovina, but I think more generally the Western Balkans, this general feeling of we cannot afford to be too strict, otherwise the region is going to somehow go in an opposite geopolitical direction. I think this is an underlyingly false argument. I mean, the region is where it is and it's not going anywhere. And in fact, it is precisely by not putting emphasis on these points that the risk not so much of things happening from the outside, but for things degenerating on the inside that will geopolitically lead the, the region in a different direction. Uh, and therefore, I, I, you know, I personally believe, and this is what I say both publicly and, and, and privately, um, that, that really, you know, as I said, we don't have anything to lose to be, you know, in being more assertive on these questions. Uh, and we have a lot to lose by not uh, being, being more assertive. And then the final point that I wanted to make is, is really transatlantically. And 
And I think that, again, and, and this is a broader point on, on the transatlantic relationship, but I think it particularly regards the Western Balkans. I think it would be obviously wonderful to see the United States uh, re-engage uh, more, I would say not only more substantively, but also more clearly, in a sense, in, in the region. But to me, the most important thing uh, has less to do with quantity, uh, and in a sense, more to do with quality and coordination. I think as, as Europeans, um, it would be a terrible mistake to simply assume that, hey, you know, the United States is back, and therefore this means that we can simply sit back ourselves. I think this ultimately is and will remain uh, a European responsibility. And what we can hope for, and I think expect from a Biden administration, is the magic word coordination. I think this is ultimately what has been missing over the last four years, and it's essentially what we what we can uh, hope and expect uh, to recuperate, to sort of you know get back uh, with the Biden administration. So it is a question of coordination, whether it is coordinating on small or big things, whether it is about uh, sanctions uh, or incentives or, or sort of uh, surgical interventions, as Maida, you you put it. It is really a story of coordination and dialogue. But with you know, having at the back of our minds as Europeans, the fact that who has to be front and center in this relationship is us as Europeans, uh, rather than the United States. Uh, because as I said, it would be a terrible mistake for us to, as Europeans to simply uh, look at what is happening as the United States as a perfect excuse to sort of step back from what our own responsibilities are. Thank you very much, Natalie. You said something um, about the lack of EU perspective slowing things down and the lack of credible perspective um, for EU integration for the region. Um, and I would say, you know, in the case of Bosnia, the EU has its enlargement instruments, but it also has many other instruments, precisely because Bosnia was a foreign policy and security challenge and issue, and it remains to be. Um, but what, what seems to be lacking uh, is kind of political interest and, you know, Bosnia is not very high, has not been for a long time on the radar of policymakers. And Ambassador Hoiskin will remember that during the early 2000 and 2005, when there was much more interest, coordination, but also higher level political interest, things, you know, things went quite well during these couple of years. Um, and so could I ask you, Senator Shaheen, to, you know, maybe react to what Natalie uh, has said, but also tell us, you know, do you expect Bosnia to disappear from the radar and the focus to go on solving Kosovo and Serbia dispute, which, by the way, we've been dealing with since 2016, when I moved to Washington, I've been hearing we need to focus on solving this dispute. We've now solved Macedonia, Greece, and we have Northern Macedonia Prespa Agreement. Now we fix that, and then Bosnia will follow. Can we afford that? Um, and, you know, how, how do things look like from where you sit? Um, well, thank you. And, Natalie, obviously, you're a very good diplomat because um, your analysis of the last four years of the Trump administration is that coordination would is the magic word. I would argue there are a lot of other things that are missing there. Um, but uh, obviously, I'm I'm a big supporter of President-elect Biden, so I have a bias here. Um, but I, I I hope that I'm not sure that we can afford to say um, we're going to sequence. Um, these events in this way, because uh, obviously there are things, there are events happening throughout the Balkans in other parts of Europe that are very important for us to address. And to, it's very positive that the Republic of North Macedonia is now a NATO member and that um, they're moving forward. But that shouldn't prevent our um, doing everything we can to support other countries in the Balkans and to address the challenges in Bosnia. And I think what is what is most encouraging is what you pointed out, Maida, and that is the, the young people who are looking at the future of their country and saying, we want a, we want a different future 
than the one we see right now. Uh, we have a, probably a similar example in the United States in, in the Black Lives Matter movement and the young people across this country who marched for racial justice earlier this summer. And also those young people who are concerned about gun safety because of school shootings. And we have seen the difference in America that that kind of intervention by young people and making their voices heard can move the political and policy decisions in a way that's very positive. And so anything we can do to encourage uh, civic engagement to support young people, both in terms of um, economic opportunity, but also in terms of their engagement in their country is going to be really important. And it's one of the reasons that the Senate Foreign Relations Committee and um, I pushed to try and get this report on what we're supporting in terms of our economic problems in Bosnia and how we can stay focused on young people and ensuring that we support their efforts to give them opportunities and to get them more engaged because they clearly are the future and we need to think about how we can support their efforts. Thank you, Senator Shaheen. We also showed a couple of times during this conference a documentary that was made and directed um, by a group of young students from Banja Luka, Mostar and Sarajevo and directed by a high school professor. Uh, who has formed this drama group and initiative to connect um, students all over Bosnia to interact and express themselves through drama and arts. And <clears throat> the film, the documentary ends with um, the student who, first of all, all of the students saying they, sh you know, don't all want to leave. If they leave, who is going to change the country? They do want to stay. The immigration rate is huge, um, and most of them want to go to the EU and specifically Germany. Um, and the last scene is the student with his hands tied around with a duct tape, um, sending a message, we want to change things, but our hands are tied. Um, and I, that brings me back um, to, you know, untie, them hand, to untie their hands, what needs to happen and what sort of, you know, acupunctural support needs to, needs to come from outside. And, you know, two things that I keep hearing constantly from not just activists in Bosnia, but from, you know, pol those potential political leaders who could be a Zoran Zaev of, of Bosnia and Herzegovina and Nikola Dimitrov, who are now carving out space at the local level in the cantons and municipalities is we need a level playing field. And the level playing field also means reforming the electoral law, which is currently heavily tilted in the favor of nationalist politicians that are holding the state capture. But the and, and that is part of the EU conditionality of EU 14 priorities. We have a judgment by the European Court of Human Rights on the Finci decision. Um, but the way the narrative on the electoral law and the agenda and the discourse is shaped, in fact, goes into an entirely different direction. Um, we have a very strong initiative from the HDZ in Bosnia and Zagreb to, in fact, reform the electoral law and tilt it even further towards, you know, ethnicization rather than in such a way as to encourage politicians to moderate by speaking to other groups and in that way encourage moderation of political discourse. Um, Ambassador Hoskin, I'll ask the difficult question to you because Germany is such an important player. Do you see a potential of mobilizing a stronger, and Natalie also to you as you know, someone um, looking from Brussels and talking to the decision makers, can we mobilize a coalition of willing states to be firmer on preventing further ethnic fragmentation of the country and in fact establishing such institutional legal framework as to create the level playing field? I think we, we definitely have to do it, but we have to be realistic. When you are in government, when you are a government official, 
um, when you see the um, uh, challenges as we have it in the legislation in, in Bosnia, and you mentioned uh, Sedic Finci, um, you have to deal with politicians. And um, um, I know that Valentin Insko is, is working day and night about this. We did this uh, back um, in the um, around 2000. Um, and, and 10, I believe, a bit, um, we invited all the different leaders from the different parties um, to Berlin one-on-one -on -one and talk to them and, saw, and, and try to get them agree to a um, law that corresponds to what the European Court of Justice um, or European um, Human Rights Court want, and that is to get rid of Sedic Finci, which basically excludes anybody that does not have one of the three ethnic groups um, as a background from, um, um, from, from getting office. It was not possible and it remains extremely difficult because um, the vested interests of uh, about um, which I spoke earlier make sure that the different ethnic groups um, um, have, of course, with their seats going along then also the rights to um, um, different uh, parts of the economy or of um, um, you know the utilities of um, where money flows in and and you you have to look after your um, um, the people that vote for you and um, as long as the responsible politicians don't have the um, the overall um, well-being of the country uh, in, in, in their mind, but the well-being of their own ethnic group, those who vote for them, then we have a huge problem. Um, I think we, we, need to be, we need to be tougher um, on that, but um, it is difficult. We cannot, um, no, a government cannot work with um, civil society, um, but can also do it. So I think what um, I've missed uh, when you showed the, the example of young people, this is what we have to do. I think our political foundations have to get engaged there. We have to promote these people so that then um, they also have an, uh, get an electoral base so that um, in the end um, they become more powerful and then can change this political system. Um, uh, and, and I think this is, this is the only... What is very important is that we remain focused and coming back to what the senator said to to have a coordination with the biden government not that we ask the us to be in the lead but um, we have to resolve this as natalie also said um, but to have the us on board the guarantor of, of data is so important so we were we work hand in hand and then we can can move into into this um, into this direction and um, um, uh, with regard to um, enlargement of the European Union, yes, the European Union is slow, but you have to understand those in the European Union who see, and many of the, the founding fathers and mothers think, well, maybe we move too quickly if all of a sudden in countries like Hungary and Poland, what we thought was um, self understood as the basis of the European Union, the rule of law, uh, free media, and everything is all is then all of a sudden put into doubt. Then people say, well, should we even go further in, 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 in enlarging the European Union and uh, get um, possibly even more problems into the EU? So um, I think you also have to understand that perspective, uh, which is very strong in, in parliaments. But um, uh, of course, the European Union needs to be open. Thessaloniki, the European Council 2001, clearly said that all countries have um, the membership perspective and that has to be filled, um, of course, with, with life. But conditionality and the countries have to um, really live, not only uh, um, sign up to it, but live the European values that the European Union stands for. And there, we are not there yet in Bosnia and Herzegovina, unfortunately. Not with the, um, the people who actually, um, many of them, who wield power in those countries, in this country. Thank you very much, Ambassador Huysken. Before I go with uh, my next question to Natalie, I would like to just uh, ask our uh, participants in the chat and on the live stream um, to send, if they have questions, to send them through our chat functions. Please do not send questions on Kosovo and Serbia. Um, 
In fact, I have reserved this time to talk about Bosnia specifically. So if you have questions on Bosnia, EU, US policy on Bosnia, send them in. We're not taking questions on Kosovo and Serbia. Um, Natalie, um, one more time to you. When I was a PhD student, uh, you were my, well, I, I did my PhD at the European University Institute and you were a fellow uh, during that time. And I loved and used your book for my PhD thesis on Cyprus and EU's role in conflict resolution in Cyprus and it inspired me to think about many things in Bosnia. And one of the, you know, one of the key points that you stress is the role of Greece as a member state in blocking EU's capacity to really act as a neutral actor and to resolve the conflict. Now, we have a similar problem since we were talking about the elections law and I won't get you into nitty gritty details of the elections law, don't worry. But I do want your more kind of at a higher level of generality, your comment about how do we deal with the same problem that we now have with Croatia's membership in the EU. Um, that is really to a large extent shaping Brussels position and Brussels policy on these fundamental issues in Bosnia. We basically have a Cyprus case repeating. How do we deal with that? Uh, in many respects, Maida, I think you have much worse than the Cyprus case repeating. I mean, you know, perhaps but before I say something on this, I just wanted to come back to a point that, uh, that Christoph was making, which I think is, is crucial. Um, and, and, and it's this question of, um, you know, given the way in which uh, the uh, enlargement uh, to Central Eastern Europe uh, worked out, and given the problems concerning rule of law, et cetera, that we are seeing in, in Hungary and Poland, et cetera, uh, this has basically put a, um, you know, ha has dampened, I mean, has, has given, let me put it this way, has given good arguments uh, for those that say that uh, the enlargement process uh, has to has to be slow and, and had to be slowed down. And, and of course, you know, that there is some merit to that argument, although I do think that um, conceptually it's important to frame this um, in, in, in a more, in a sense, sort of comprehensive and organic way. I mean, in many respects, one could say that the problem uh, in the past was basically looking at transformation as something that has a beginning, a beginning and an end. And the end had to happen with uh, accession. And somehow once their accession happened, everything would remain perfectly static and we would have wonderful uh, countries, you know, wonderful liberal democracies abiding to human rights and rule of law and all good things. And of course, we know that, um, and we know it not only for Hungary and Poland, I mean, we know it in Italy, we know it in the United States. I mean, you know, change happens constantly, and at times it can go in a positive direction, at times it can go in a very negative direction. And so I think the question is, and is, you know, it has to be clearly, and therefore, how do we uh, address and revise the accession policy? And I think that question to an extent has been addressed. Now the question is, are we actually implementing it uh, properly? But that question of front-loading reforms, etc., has been uh, addressed. Uh, but in order to address the problem in its entirety, the point is that we need to work, and indeed we are working, on what happens after accession takes place, which is why this whole discussion over rule of law and the EU budget uh, is really part and parcel. It's the other side of the coin and one cannot be uh, addressed uh, without uh, without the other. But coming right to, uh, to your question, uh, as I said, I, I think in the case of Bosnia, um, it, it's a far more serious problem because in a sense, you know, in the case of Cyprus, we're talking about two communities in which, if you like, the reference, the external reference points, I mean, the imbalance was created uh, by the fact that you had uh, one country that was in Greece and another country that was out Turkey. And the problem with Bosnia is that uh, you have you have three uh, communities and you have indeed one country which is very clear, you know, one reference, external reference country which is very clearly in. Uh, but, but then you have other other countries. Uh, you have a Russia which has an influence on Serbia, uh, which therefore has an influence. So it, it is a far more complex uh, c construction. 
which in a sense, I think has its um, obvious negatives, which I think were those that you were hinting at, uh, but it also has potential positives. And what I mean by positives is that it's not a fixed game. Mm -hmm. uh, it is something that can be played in a sense in, in different ways, so long as we are all kind of cognizant of the fact that there is this kind of internal, external dimension uh, um, when it comes to, to Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, but, but, but precisely because it can, in a sense, work, the dynamic can work in different ways, uh, it is not necessarily a dynamic which is, if you like, structurally imbalanced uh, necessarily and always in the same way. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. We have five minutes left uh, for this panel. Sen Senator Shaheen, would you like to react to Ambassador Hoiskins and Natalie's statements? Um, and then perhaps we can take a question or two. Um, I would, because I think both Ambassador and Natalie in particular point out the very real challenges that we have in a democracy. And that is that democracies aren't easy. And we have seen that over the last four years in the United States, and particularly now as we look at just having had an election in November for our president and the current president and a number of elected officials who have tried to undermine that election. And it points to the very real importance, and we, you know, sometimes we have to be careful about how we do this, but that we've got to stand up for the rule of law. Those of us who are in positions of decision making need to point out when that happens and what's wrong with it and why it doesn't um, stand up to the importance of democracy. And, uh, you know, I, I appreciate that there are countries in the EU now, um, you mentioned Hungary and Poland, that have had those challenges. But it's really important, just as it is in the United States, that those of us who are concerned make our voices heard and continue to point that out. Because if we don't do that, then ultimately we're not gonna be successful. And people are gonna think, oh, well, that's okay. You know, that we're having this debate right now about the number of people who have been influenced by um, President Trump's statements about the election in the US being fraudulent. And we've got to point out to people, oh no, it wasn't, he is not correct. Our courts have stood up to that. And a number of our elected officials have stood up to that, but a number have not. And it's important for us to continue to, to send those messages, to make those points so that people um, get the difference. Absolutely. And if I may just add a note on this one, um, coming originally from Bosnia and as someone who has then moved to the U.S. to study, I did my undergraduate degree in Atlanta, Georgia, um, and there is a very large Bosnian community in, in Georgia, but in particular in Atlanta. Um, and if I may say, among the most alarmed communities um, at President Trump's um, early, you know, signals that he intends to undermine um, American democracy institutions were probably precisely those who had fled such system and came to America appreciating the functioning and democratic institutions and the rule of law that U.S. was able to provide. And so um, I think that it is this ap appreciation um, of, you know, what you don't have at home, but what you find in your new home that has also mobilized a huge number of Bosnians uh, to vote in these elections. I think the numbers are around 10,000 Bosnians in Georgia. So um, I think there is a huge amount of respect for providing them a home where rule of law and, is respected uh, and institutions function. And uh, before we finished, we have about two or three minutes left. I have one question, which brings us back a little bit from the rule of law to security issue. And it's posed by Kurt Bessiner, um, who is a uh, senior uh, fellow with the Democra uh, Democratization Policy Council and who is writing, BIH is effectively a rules-free environment now. 
the EU-led policy to issue the Datement Enforcement Instruments has helped lead here. What do the participants believe ought to be done to re-establish adherence to the Dayton rules? Ambassador Hoiskin mentioned OHR and bond powers being de-arrested. Do you also think that we need to strengthen U-force deterrent power? Who wants to take this one? I'll let Ambassador Hoiskin, since it's U-force. So um, I'm afraid I have to respond to EU4 is EU, so Natalie could also respond it. Um, first, I, I think that we need, um, we need um, the OHR. We need um, a continuation of the international presence. I find it a key that in the Constitutional Court, we continue to have senior um, judges from the European Union. Because um, coming back to what the senator said, um, with a president who said that, um, who continues to say that these elections were flawed, etc. Um, if it were according to him, he would just uh, stay in the White House. But thanks to the institutions of this country, thanks to the Constitutional Court, um, thanks to the institution of governors, of um, those who certified elections, um, there was um, no, um, in, in, in all states, also in Republican states, I think this showed the strength of the democracy in this country, and this is what we need also then in Europe. And when you see now on the Constitutional Court how important that was, um, others. So we see at the same time, and now I come back to Europe, how um, critical it is if in Poland now the Constitutional Court, the court system is um, um, also put into question. Or you just had last week that one of the big publishing houses in uh, um, Poland was bought from a German owner and was now taken over by a Polish owner and uh, um, the consequences that this may ha have on the um, uh, you know, variety of media you, you, you can get. Now, to respond to your question, I think the long-range goal should be to have Bosnia and Herzegovina stand um, on its own feet. So we cannot have um, you know, Valentin Insko stay there um, for another 50 years. And, uh, um, uh, the judges, so they have to, they have to acquire ownership. Um, but um, with regard to U4, I do think with regard to security, um, I do not believe that right now we should um, go back to a situation uh, that was there before, where we have a major, um, uh, major troops there. I think we, we should continue to support in building the institutions. Um, also, the, the, you know, the, the armed forces uh, still need to um, you know, really, um, as it is in Dayton, combine and, and have um, clarity about that. But um, I don't think that uh, strengthening you for would at this stage be the, um, the right, um, the right uh, uh, response. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hoskin. We are now exactly at the end of our panel. I just want to make two final concluding points. The first one, I was warned uh, at the beginning, before the panel started, that Senator Shaheen may have to step out to vote uh, on the Senate floor. And I will interpret uh, the fact that you have not had to leave as a very positive symbolic message that the United States is staying involved in the Balkans and with its European partners. So I like the symbolism. Um, and if I may just ask, you know, the, the perfect way in fact to end this panel is to reiterate what Ambassador Hoiskin has just said. The reason why uh, President Trump is not able to undermine the legitimacy of American elections is because of strong institutions and of impartial constitutional court that is able to take certain decisions. And this is where we want to get to Bosnia. We're not there yet. Abandoning constitutional court and removing the European judges at this point would not mean local ownership. 
it would mean even further consolidation of state capture. So I thank you for that closing note, Ambassador Hoitskin. I thank to all three of you for taking time from your busy, very busy schedules. Um, and we are entering a full lockdown in Germany tomorrow, so we're very grateful to have been able to welcome you from Berlin on the last day before we go into lockdown. All the best and Merry Christmas. Thank you. Stay Thank safe. Thank you. It was, a, it was a pleasure to participate in this round. Bye bye to everybody. Thank you. Bye, bye everyone. Bye everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much thank to our panelists for joining us. And thank you to our moderator, Maida Ruge, for really shaping that important conversation. We do come to the end of our two-day conference now. And uh, throughout this conference, we've heard um, the importance of future generations brought up over and over again. Um, just in this last panel, you've heard Ambassador Hoiskin um, really highlight, uh, highlight that topic. And um, now we're really delighted uh, to bring in four high school students from across Bosnia for closing statements and some messages for us to take away. You've seen all four of them in the documentary we've shown a few times throughout uh, this conference. I'd like to ask uh, each one of them the same question one by one. I'll, I'll give you the order in just a second. Um, but what I would like to ask them is, um, you, you come from different uh, parts of the country. You come from Sarajevo, Mostar, Banja Luka. Um, these places are sometimes controlled by contradictory, sometimes opposing political forces. So do you think that there is um, something that unites all four of you? Apart from acting in this documentary together, of course, do you think that there is more that unites you or more that divides you? I would like to start with Dean Hodžić calling in from Sarajevo, please. Hi, Dean. Can you hear me? Hi, can you hear? Yes, I can. Uh, my name is Din Hodgic, as you present me, uh, and I would like to answer your question in a positive way, that there is more different things that connect us, and I'm really glad that it is as it is, because as we were filming the documentary, uh, we were going to the Banaluka, and we, were, we weren't actually paying that much attention to the politics. We introduced to each other, we talked about sports, we talked about music. So there is more than just the politics and this movie that can actually connect or divide us. Uh, I think that it's important for each young people or each youth actually uh, to be included in more activities and more different kind of uh, art or maybe sports, just to have something uh, together with other students in other countries or regions. That's really important for us in Bosnia and Herzegovina. Uh, and I would like to send a message to all the youth to participate and to introduce each other to the different kind of, to the people of different nation and different religion, because it is really important and you will be really satisfied when you see how much same things and how much, uh, how much you have the uh, same interests with each other. Thank you so much. I'm really glad to hear that. And now I would like to please hear from Georgia Dujković from Banja Luka. Georgia, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I feel a bit like Eurovision here, but I'm glad this is working out. <laughs> Georgia, can, uh, can we please have your answer? Would you like me to repeat the question? Well, no, there's no need to repeat. Well, great. Uh, I must be honest and say that there are more differences between us. Uh, how do I know that? Well, with with three colleagues of mine, I've done a research and we called it uh, the Dayton Pass the Exam. And in two parts of this research, we saw that um, th there are a lot of similar similarities between us. Uh, let's say like uh, from what uh, sources do we uh, take information and which, cir which circles do we trust most? But the third part, which was uh, the, which was gifted to the Dayton and the 25, 25th anniversary showed that we have different approaches to the Dayton. We, uh, different ethnic groups saw uh, different uh, people uh, who protected the Dayton and then who uh, um, did wrong to the Dayton. But even in that part of the research, we saw that there is a uh, little hope that we can 
talk to each other and come to some conclusions that will provide a safer future. For example, uh, the, the majority of youth, no matter the ethnic group, said that the 21st November should be a state holiday. So on some uh, topics, we can come to a together and common conclusion. So dialogue is the key of our future. Thank you, Georgia. And, and I think it's very worthwhile to hear the differences in perspective. You know, we don't always have to agree. That's, that's not what will bring us forward, surely. Um, and, and thank you for some of the statistics that you've mentioned. We have one here that says that 50% of students in Bosnia have never read the Dayton Agreement. Um, so as you mentioned, also, they have different media sources and, and places where they get their information. It's certainly not straight from the source, at least for half of the students. Um, now I would like to please move to Lucia Batch, who you've seen uh, earlier on one of our panels uh, calling in from Mostar. Lucia, can we please hear from you? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I would choose to agree with Dan. I think that we do have more similarities than differences, but think, the thing is that the differences are drastic ones. The differences are, for example, po po politics, uh, nationality, religion, and those are the, the ones that divide us in the end. Mm -hmm. If you take four of us here present, uh, as an example, we are both, we are all from the Balkans, we all are from the same country. We kind of live in the same mindset. All of our ancestors went to the same troubles of war. So we have a lot of things in common. We are all young and we are all seeking for a better future for ourselves and our country. Thank you very much. I think that's very wise and, and, and really shows you, it uh, depends on how far you want to zoom out. Uh, that's how many differences or similarities you'll find. Um, last but not least, I'd like to ask Hanadi Ademovic from Sarajevo, please. Can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I think that I will agree with Lucia and Din. Uh, there are a lot of similar similarities that will help us bring it help us bring everyone together but we need to work on them we need to uh change the mindset of our young people because i think the older generations uh would like to separate us because that's what they've been doing for a long time and it's up to us to change that to change the future of bosnia and I think that if we all work together, that uh, there would be a brighter future in front of us. Thank you so much. <laughs> I, I certainly hope you are correct. Um, personally, I hate to hear that it's the, the older generations, which include some of our parents and grandparents that stand in the way of this uh, forward progress. But I hope uh, that you are correct. And I think with the energy of you and your colleagues in this film and a lot of the other um, young experts, but everybody else that we've heard from in this conference, um, I feel optimistic, which is a, a, a big feat because I'm generally a, a cynic, a very strong one. So with that, I'd like to uh, take it over to my colleague Maida Ruge for some closing statements. Thank you, Anna. Um, what we've heard in the course of the two days of this conference has at times been rather depressing. And perhaps, you know, one depressing bit, obviously, besides the message coming from the student documentary, is also um, a discussion on the rule of law and the state of rule of law in Bosnia. And mm, an important detail there for many of us who have participated in the rule of law reforms in, you know, early 2000s is how quickly a progress can be reversed, as happened in the judiciary of Bosnia. Um, so sometimes it feels like an uphill battle, uh, a Sisyphus battle that kind of never ends. But um, I think the fact that we were joined by voices um, of young people, young Bosnians, full of ideas, energy, um, willingness to really uh, improve things on the ground and with a completely open European outlook um, shows us that there are 
partners in Bosnia that there is huge potential um, and that they actually want to move their country forward. Um, but they can't do it alone. And thankfully, as President Clinton has also urged, we've heard, including in the last panel, that there is international commitment. There is a recognition in Washington, in Brussels, in Berlin, but also in London, um, Rome, Paris, and other capitals, that if we join our forces um, and really act strategically without huge additional political investment, we can give these young, progressive, enthusiastic actors wind in the sails. And we'd also like to thank all of our speakers who've joined us from both sides of the Atlantic and to all of you who watched us on Zoom or on live stream and also for the uplifting conversations on social media. Uh, it's, that's not uh, generally true for Balkan Twitter, but the conversations we've seen in the last two days have really been wonderful, so thank you for that. Um, we sincerely hope that we don't have to organize this conference again in 25 years, or in five years for that matter. But we will keep up our work on Bosnia, on the Western Balkans, and we hope you will find it useful and interesting um, in the time to come. So once again, thank you for joining us. This is goodbye from ECFR and from Berlin. Uh, we wish you to stay healthy, happy holidays, and as my mother always says, pamet uglav. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you.